On second thought, I decided that right now was a good time to upgrade the camera. So here we are in 60 frames per second, full HD, which is what we had before, but this is better quality. And we even have autofocus now, so I can move the camera around a little bit uh, without having to manually have it hunt, hunt around. So I hope you enjoy it, and let's get back to the project. We only had a brief look at the arm last week, so I thought it'd be good to go back and see some of the more interesting parts. The frame itself is pretty self-explanatory, just half-inch plywood. The counterweights, though, we used up some scrap that we had laying around, which is a pretty good selection. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we got out the acetylene torch and cut those up. Some of these rolled sway bars, some of them were who knows what, but it's fun. The axles are up next. Now previously I've done this by just putting 5 16 bolts through the bearings and where I need to have a tighter fit I'll wrap it with this foil duct tape which actually works fairly well and I did it on the escapement cradle project but it's pretty time consuming and uh, you know the precision is not it, it's okay it's it's mainly the time consuming thing and if you need to adjust it it's a real pain in the butt. So what I've done here is I've actually upgraded to using real shafts and then the way that I'm changing those is that I bought a lathe because a lathe is a capability that I did not have at all before. It's very difficult to approximate uh, with other tools whereas a mill you can you can get away with certain things with a drill press and all that. It'll be accurate enough. So I don't if you remember on the escapement cradle project that we were, had to thin down a shaft with an angle grinder and it just was very painful and awkward <laughs> and uh, more mentally painful than physically. But overall, I've been really glad with the purchase and it came in handy just the other day. We were working on something where you can see here we needed to go from a 5 16 rubber hose to a 5 16 steel and we had to use this barb specifically. So we took that, turned it down, made a collar that went over it that brought it up to the right size, then soldered it on there and put the compression fitting on. It worked great, no leaks. I should clarify though that the shiny new shafts are only for the final version of this project because we're going to have cantilevering on those joints so we want them for the increased thickness with the larger bearings and also for the increased precision you know both of those being helpful but uh, for the moment we're just going to keep using the same bolts because they're cheap and they're soft and, and they get the job done quick for, for doing a prototype. In order to move the arm we have to fix the shaft to, to that arm. So what we've done is just ground some flat spots on the bolt and then we run quarter 20 bolts down into it to use it just like an oversized set screw. At the moment I'm planning to drive these with timing belt pulleys and those are held on with, with actual set screws and another flat spot on the shaft. The timing belts themselves are driven by stepper motors which are down lower on a piece of wood that has two slots on either side and that fits around the screws so it's easy enough to back off the screws and adjust the tension on the belt. I have a somewhat troubled history with electronics though, so before I jumped into trying to drive this uh, sort of commercial stepper motor, I thought it was best to try and hack one together and make sure I really understood what was going on. So I yanked this one out of an old VCR. This is off the reed head, I think, and uh, I chipped away the circuit board so that none of the components on there would interfere. I would be straight into the coils. And despite what a lot of, but uh, what everything that I found online will tell you, which is that if it has six wires, it has a center tap on the coils. This one has three coils. It absolutely does. I know it for a fact. Anyway, and what I did was built my own dual H bridge or triple, triple dual H, triple H bridge setup, uh, just with transistors and everything you can see here. Fried all, fried all of them at least once. And I used this to drive it, and this made sure that I really understood exactly what was going on in the stepper motor. I thought it was interesting that you could hear the motor running. Since it doesn't have brushes, it's basically a brushless motor. I don't know if this falls under the magneto striction that uh, Ben Kresnow in Applied Science was talking about recently. But more interesting than that, I thought, was that if you, if you lift the motor up and sort of damp it with a glove or with your hand, and you put the mic right down here near the circuit board, you can actually hear what I assume must be the transistors clicking on and off. And I checked the frequency from the mic, the little spikes on it, and it lines up pretty well with uh, on-off clicks for each one.
Another good lesson from this exercise was the significance of missing steps. So what we're looking at here is a little representation of a stepper motor, and it goes one, two, three, one, two, three. It continues around in a, indefinitely on the circle. So if you're at position two and you tell it to go to position three, it'll go there. Then you tell it position one, and it'll continue on around the circle. So the problem arises when you're at two and you tell it to go to three, but it doesn't make it. So it's still at two. Then you tell it one, and it goes backwards. Now everything is kind of screwed up, and your steps are out of are, are out of count. So the reason this is an issue for me is that this is going to take quite a bit of torque to get this thing started, and I don't have a lot of experience with control in these yet. And my concern is that you're going to miss the steps and not be able to re-instruct it to go to the next step. You can only go forward and backward on the pre-built drivers that I've seen. The pre-built drivers have nice things like micro-stepping and it's all tidy in a very small package, has heat sinks built in. But I may also build my own driver if I don't find another way around this because it'd be really handy when you can when you can manually energize a coil in one direction or the other and tell it exactly what you want it to do. All of these control strategies are useless though if we don't have a way of knowing where we are because the motor doesn't give you any feedback. So what we're going to use is called a rotary encoder and itself looks like a small motor. This one is 600 pulses per revolution, so one full revolution, 600 pulses. Although you can get 1200 out of it, I'll mention that later. So we're going to hook it up here in, uh, in line with the axis itself so that we get the direct output. And the way that these work is that they're sort of like a fan blade on the inside. And you have two lights which shine through it, basically, you know, this is the, the concept. And uh, by looking at which one is blocked first, you can tell which direction it's going. And by looking, by seeing how many times they blink on and off, you can tell how many revolutions that you've gone. So it doesn't give you absolute position. It's just incremental is what they call them, incremental encoders. And uh, we can actually see this on the oscilloscope too. So I've got it hooked up with the same colors that we used on the previous diagram. And you can see when I rotate it here, it's triggering off the yellow. So that's gonna stay in the center. As I rotate it faster or slower, we get more or less pulses. And I don't know which it actually is, but we can say up means that it's clear, and then a low means that it's blocked by the, the fan blade, so to speak. And you can see I go in one direction there, it's yellow and then blue to the right, and then the other direction is blue on the left and yellow to the right. Basically the blue is shifting which side of the yellow that it's on. That's because I'm going in different directions. So if we count the pulses that we get, we can tell which uh, how far that we've gone, and if we count the going up on the pulse and going down, that's how we get the 1200 out. All of these things are relatively new for me at the moment. I've had an interest in electronics and different things before, but never had the patience to go through and uh, learn the fundamentals of it. One major problem that I've had with electronics is that you can't see what's going on inside it. With mechanical things, I learned early on from my RC car actually, I think was the very first one with the carburetor and the the uh, high-end needle and the low-end needle and all that. You couldn't figure out quite what was going on, so I took it apart 100%, and once you've done that and you see exactly how everything works, I never had a problem after that. It never, and I've applied that to other things too, things large and small. You just disassemble it down virtually to every component, and you you will understand extremely well how it works at least for me, someone who's mechanically oriented. And so the problem with electronics is that you can't do that. So a combination of watching the EEV blog, I'm not quite sure how I stumbled onto that. It's one of those internet things. You wander down the rabbit hole, I guess. And then I came across the Applied Science channel also. And I was watching these guys use their oscilloscopes, and I thought, hey, we've used those in, in physics in college. And <laughs> why didn't I think of that? And so with that, you can see inside of it. And uh, for a variety of reasons, I've developed more patience lately to go back and learn the fundamentals and really get in there and get excited about what's going on with the super basic things rather than trying to leap in and read variables out of sensors and, and just get lost into it. And then it, you become frustrated and you end up moving on. So definitely a, a thank you from you know one person, I'm sure among many, to Dave Jones and uh, Ben Krasnow because it's been very helpful and gotten me excited about it again. I got a lot of projects that I'd like to integrate some electronic components along with the mechanical ones as well. So that's it for this week. 
Thank you for watching, and we'll be back next week with more progress on the project.